Our guest today is Dr. Tracy Stein. Tracy has a PhD and a master's in public health. She's a Columbia University trained psychologist, certified clinical hypnotherapist, and award-winning author. She is also the creator of a series of popular guided imagery, self-hypnosis, and meditation audio programs on topics such as freedom from procrastination, achieving a healthy weight, self-compassion, mindfulness meditation, intuition development, manifesting a desired future, and enjoying deep restorative sleep. These audio meditations enlist the power of the mind to help listeners break free from unhealthy patterns and tap into their highest potential in body, mind, and spirit. Tracy has formally trained in intuitive development for over two decades, and this thread of intuition has been woven throughout her work and life. As an educator, she integrates science and spirit in her work at the Spirituality Mind Body Institute at Teachers College, Columbia University. Tracy has been featured, on, uh, she has been featured or quoted in O, the Oprah Magazine, Health, Shape.com, Women's Health, and other publications. And she has been interviewed on numerous radio programs and podcasts. Tracy's own podcast, Unpacking Possibility with Dr. Tracy Stein, highlights the journeys of people who have tapped into their intuition, overcome challenges, reached meaningful goals, and who share their strategies for profound personal transformation. In her new Hemisync album, entitled Cultivating Intuition, The Foundation, she guides you through some fundamental exercises to discern intuitive guidance and gain greater confidence in your innate abilities. Here's Tracy Stein. So Tracy, we're here to talk about intuition today, um, right? So for you personally, you're naturally intuitive. How, how did you find out you were intuitive? Well, that's such a good question. Um, it, you know, I think everyone is naturally intuitive, but for me, I noticed from early on, I had experiences that were different from those of a lot of my friends and family members. So um, I absolutely saw spirits when I was younger, probably from the time I was two or three. Not all the time. It actually scared me quite a bit. <laughs> so I was glad when that lessened. Um, but I would have precognitive dreams and see sparks of light around people sometimes when they were experiencing strong emotion. And over time, I, I studied um, energy work and I trained in Reiki. And I noticed that when I had my hands in people's energy fields, or even if I was working on them at a distance, I would pick up information in a variety of ways. Um, mm. So, you know, a whole, a whole range of experiences, but I, I eventually wound up seeking training to learn how to kind of have more control and um, both to kind of shut down, but also to tune in more specifically rather than waiting for things to just kind of happen. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So I actually had kind of a similar experience growing up um, and I thought it was normal. Uh, until I got to school and figured out that the other kids weren't having those experiences. Um, how was that for you? Like, did you find that it kind of shut down a little bit when that happened or how did you manage that? So <laughs> it's probably no wonder that I became a psychologist because yeah. I definitely felt a little bit like the weird kid. I mean, yeah. I had friends, um, but my friends didn't experience it, these things. And, um, you know, what was wonderful is as I got older, I did wind up meeting people who had had various intuitive experiences and that really normalized them for me. And then I started reading um, work by a variety of people, both people who do research um, about intuitive phenomena, but also people who shared their experiences. Um, and I think one of the most wonderful things about that was realizing that the thing that I think most kids think about is, you know, the magic and what if the world were magic and we have all these fairy tales and movies that reinforce that over time, society kind of, you know, takes that away from us or says, oh, that's not true. And as you start to develop your intuition, it really does feel like you are reacquainting yourself with that feeling that, oh, the world is kind of a magical uh, and, and unlimited place. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so to kind of put a finer point on this, I mean, there are different types of um, intuitive faculties, let's say, you know, from clairsentience to clairaudience to clairvoyance. I mean, how would you kind of describe yourself? 
So at different points in my life, uh, different senses were more prominent. I probably, I, I think I have all of the types of intuitive experiences. When I was very young, they were primarily clairvoyant. So I would see um, things that seemed to be outside of me, but also the, the movie in your mind and have very vivid and prophetic dreams. Mm. Um, but also occasionally I would have clairaudient clair experiences and hear a song playing in my mind very loudly before I heard it on the radio or on TV and, and so forth. Even if I hadn't heard it in a long time, um, I'm, I'm a naturally empathic person. And that makes for me being a better therapist, I think, because I'm attuned to what people are thinking and feeling. But I think most empathic people who are that way psychologically are also empathic um, psychically. And mm -hmm. so the clear sentience is something definitely I notice. That might be one of the things I notice even most often these days. Interesting. And so you've, you've talked about already how most people are naturally intuitive. Um, they might not know it. Um, and so do you have any tips for folks that might want to um, kind of reawaken or expand on this capacity that they have and might not be fully cognizant of? Yeah, there, there are so many things people can do. So what I learned actually through my study of remote viewing and some of the research is that practices like mindfulness meditation can really help us to focus because intuitive guidance is often very quiet or subtle compared to the noise of everyday life. So being able to notice it requires kind of a, a, a more subtle, a more sensitive awareness to subtle phenomena. Mm -hmm. Practice is really important. If you wanted to get good at a sport, you would practice. You would get used to going through those motions and you'd strengthen your muscles and become more flexible and more agile. And, and I think it works that way with psychic development as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Very interesting. Um, so I think a lot of people expect, um, you know, messages from uh, non-ordinary sources to be spectacular or be unmistakable. Um, and that's not really the case at all. A lot of it is just kind of learning how to turn down the noise in our conscious waking mind and really pay attention, uh, really start listening and tuning in. Um, so, well, yeah. What's thoughts? interesting about what you just said is I think for a lot of people who would consider themselves not to be very psychic, the impressions they notice are the really loud and dramatic ones. So before say a natural disaster or some sort of large event, more people do report having experiences of, you know, a, a premonition or a premonition in a dream and so forth, or just a really strong feeling. Mm -hmm. But you're right. Most stuff is not that loud and it is less loud than normal daily stuff. Yeah. So I, I think a lot of the stuff that um, gets written about or talked about is of the loud variety. Um, <laughs> But you talk a lot about kind of working with the mundane, you know, with the everyday experience. And to me, that's really where the rubber meets the road. Um, how do you kind of work with the mundane? So to me, I think, you know, some people who study psychic development will wind up becoming professional psychics. That's not most people. Yeah. For most people, it's learning when what you're picking up on is not just your own mental noise, but it, it is actually... Um, intuitive information that you should pay attention to. So that could be you meet somebody um, and you're considering dating them mm. or hiring a babysitter, or you're working on a project at work and you felt stuck and your intuitive self has a much clearer understanding of what the answer might be. So being able to connect with that can help you in, in your relationships, in, in your work. Um, there were a lot of times when I felt like, the answers to an exam just seemed clearer, even if I didn't consciously know what the correct answer was. Not that not that people shouldn't study for their exams, but there's so many ways. Um, yeah. You know, so, and with your own health as well. Yeah. So you're really talking about tuning into gut feelings there. Yeah. Um, and again, for some people, it really is going to be a gut feeling. They're going to be more clairsentient and feel something in a part of their body that says something feels right. Mm-hmm or it really feels wrong. Something is not right. Somebody's telling you something, but there's something that feels very off about it. And you should pay attention to that. Yeah. Um, 
But, you know, sometimes for other people, it's just, it's a clear cognizance. It's a clear, sudden knowing. So let's talk a little bit more about using the body as an intuitive tool, because in this album that you've created with us, uh, Cultivating Intuition, um, there are four exercises. And one of them is a chakra or is a chakra uh, balancing exercise um, or energy center balancing exercise, if you prefer. Um, why is that important? So um, your energy centers and your physical body are really your instruments for tuning in. And just like you would tune your guitar or your piano, or you'd make sure your radio was dialed to the right station, you, you want to be balanced and well-tuned for lack of a better word. But the other thing is that we are interacting with other people all the time and we are taking in their stuff and it, we don't even have to be physically with them, but um, their emotional stuff, their energetic stuff, their psychological stuff. And um, it's kind of like if you went outside and you went for a jog and you were jogging past a high traffic area and you were sweating and you there's a lot of pollen in the air, you'd want to come home and shower. Yeah. You'd want to take good care of you by rinsing off the stuff that isn't great for you. And when you're talking about intuitive development, also the stuff that doesn't belong to you. So I think it's especially important for people who either tend to pick up on people's stuff and may not know it, or people who are learning to deliberately do that. You don't want to hold on to anybody's stuff. It's not yours to hold on to. And it actually feels, you can feel unwell when you do that. That's a great way to put it, um, showering off. Um, and so in terms of getting into the longer meditation that you've crafted with us, um, you're connecting with your higher self. Um, and so now we're kind of moving beyond um, gut feelings, right? And how would you sort of describe this movement or this transition? So the imagery utilizes a lot of things that work well, even when you're not working intuitively, but I think they work especially well when you are working intuitively. So mindfulness, helping you keep focused, um, hypnotic and imagery techniques to help people um, have a sense of positive expectancy, right? Expecting that they are intuitive, that helps kind of get the inner critic out of the way because so often we endeavor to do something, we become really self-conscious or think about how hard it is. And that just that's just more mental noise that gets in the way. And the other thing is we wanna acknowledge that we are timeless and that the information that we are seeking when we're doing intuitive work could be in the past, it could be in the present, it can be in the possible future. It is, it is just as easy to connect with something in the future as it is to connect with something in the present for all intents and purposes. And using our minds and these various imagery techniques, we can, I don't think it's just psychological that we're moving forward in time and connecting with this intuitive self. I think we actually are accessing this part of us that has already learned what we're seeking to learn and, and can be helpful to us in the now. Absolutely. Um, and when, you know, I think you can take people into these, um, you know, quiet mind states, either using hemisync or uh, using uh, hypnosis or guided imagery, as you do in your clinical practice, we become a lot more receptive to this idea that time is not just linear. Um, and that can be very powerful, both for personal, um, both for personal development um, and for manifestation. Um, which I also wanted to get into that topic with you a little bit, because you also give a workshop in manifestation, correct? Yeah, I do. And, and I, and I use these tools in my own life and, mm -hmm. you know, so often we are engaging in manifesting work without realizing that we are. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a lot of the time why our fears kind of attract to us a lot of the stuff we don't want because yeah. we imbue these ideas of things with so much emotion that they become so real. We actually act in accordance with negative things sometimes before they're even here. Right. And, and we can be more thoughtful and, and have much more clear intention if we approach manifestation with awareness. But I also talk about manifesting as 
you know, the, the mystical meeting the mundane. Mm. So being willing to also be aware and attentive and do the very mundane, sometimes unexciting work to yeah. try and bring these things into being as well. I think one of the things that I find is that when you bring presence or mindfulness to mundane everyday tasks, uh, they themselves have a way of transforming. Um, they, um, you start to notice a certain magic to the mundane everyday tasks. And that is really where we spend most of our time, right? It's doing ordinary things. Um, and so that's why I say that's where the rubber meets the road. Um, but to your earlier point about manifesting or attracting things into our life that we really don't want. I think that's really common. In fact, I think people tend to do that more than um, the sort of general um, ideal of manifestation, which is obviously bringing things into your life that you do want. I sort of liken it to, you know, driving a car or riding a bike. You tend to go where your eyes are. And so if you're focused yes. on an object that you're trying to avoid, what, what often happens? You Go right into it. <laughs> so um, true. It's so true. I'm just curious because I don't think people like to hear that. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if in your clinical practice that you, you know, run into that issue a lot. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, just again, in, in a very mundane way, the expectations that we bring into any interaction and so forth really shape it. So I'm just going to give you a common example. Somebody has been dating and not had a lot of luck, and they're fully expecting that every person that they might date will turn out to be, you know, someone who doesn't get back to them or who isn't honest with them or can't commit and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I think what happens is they wind up having an uncanny ability to find those people because the movie that's playing in their minds all the time is one of constant disappointment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, as I mentioned, I've studied remote viewing and a, and a lot of physicists tend to be interested in and, and do remote viewing and which is a very systematic type yeah. of um, psychic work, a, a yeah. military, you know, created psychic procedure. But the reason I'm mentioning that is I remember Marty Rosenblatt, who is a physicist, mm talking about these possible futures and yeah. in the way I have come to think about manifesting either in both in my practice, I won't always talk about it in that way with people, but in, and in, in a more energetic way is that it's almost like you have a whole bunch of balloons attached to your hand by strings and there are an infinite number of possibilities. The thing we focus our attention on and start moving toward, it's like pulling one of those balloons closer to us. So you make something that's maybe just possible into yeah. something that's more probable. Yes. And I think of manifesting kind of like that. So I'm curious, you mentioned um, RV work. Did you start uh, doing that type of work with uh, Marty Rosenblatt or was it a different school or lineage? I'm just... That's fascinating stuff for me too. So, you know, I've, I've been to the uh, applied precognition um, conference and, you know, that was a while ago and, and I've done some of Marty's uh, associative remote viewing yeah. uh, things online, but I actually have studied more with Lori Williams and okay. with Lynn Buchanan. Lynn Buchanan so, sure. Yeah. And, and they're both just amazing. They have very different, um, ways of presenting and working with the material. Lynn, Lynn is one of the original military remote viewers yeah, and Lori right. was trained directly by him. But, you know, that's one of the things that Lynn will tell you is that practice is everything mm -hmm. and that, you know, your intention that you infuse your work with makes a difference. And one of the nice things about remote viewing is that just like mindfulness, it trains you to observe and describe without attaching to or putting your own stuff onto what you notice. Right. That's, that's, that's all really good. And so Joe McMonigle also says the same thing about practice being first and foremost. Um, but kind of going back to uh, talking about, you know, people having an expectation, let's say for a bad relationship. And so they're basically programmed in that way. Um, how do you kind of work with them to change that messaging or change that programming? 
really depends on the person and, Mm -hmm. you know, somebody's degree of openness to the more esoteric or energetic will determine whether that language comes in. But even if we're just working with the psychological, you know, and there's a lot of overlap between them, right? But um, what I love about hypnosis, even if it's not formal hypnosis, because all conversation has the potential to be hypnotic, because conversation evokes images and symbols, and that's what our subconscious loves to use. And so after identifying what they don't want, it's getting them in the practice of identifying not only what would they want, but how would it look? How would it feel to be in the body and in the emotions and the experience of having achieved something that is positive? And what does that feel like? And Mm -hmm. the more they do that, the more vivid and real those images are. And it really does create a shift in, in terms of people's expectations and their emotional state, how they carry themselves and yeah. what they notice. Because like you referred to before, you used the traffic analogy, but yeah. it's kind of like, um, you know, we have on a lens like glasses that tend to make the world look a certain way or block out certain things, right? And if we take off those glasses, we might actually see um, some things more clearly or other things that we didn't notice before. Mm-hmm. Right? We shift our focus or our gaze to something that may have been there all along, but we were just, we were too focused on something else. Right. So it sounds like um, you often take um, your clients um, through sort of a transpersonal portal or transpersonal work, um, which I don't think is how all therapy works. And that's very interesting um, because most therapists, I don't think are as attuned to the esoteric or the, or the numinous as, as someone like yourself is. Um, and so for that reason, I think therapy can be a great gateway to kind of deeper inner work. Um, and I also think that, that a lot of folks, you know, don't want to go to therapy or they'll do anything they can to avoid going to therapy. Um, what, what would you say to those people or maybe to people that have someone like that in their lives that they think could benefit from going to therapy? So it's, it's a really tough thing to answer well, and I'll tell you why I'm saying that. Um, You know, look, some people will find other ways to heal and know themselves better and um, maximize their potential in one way or another but some people really do need therapy. And Mm -hmm. it's not the kind of thing that works particularly well when someone really doesn't want to do it. Yeah. Um, And I think part of that is because sometimes people feel like, well, it's very stigmatizing or they feel like, um, you know, they'd lose control or they don't like the fact that there's a part of therapy that can feel really hard. It can be hard work, but at the end, you feel better and do better. And I think if they have a sense of that, and if they're not shamed into going, I think they can get more out of it and be more likely to, to avail themselves of something that's important. You know, some people can manage blood sugar with diet alone and, and diet and exercise. And that's great. Some people actually need medication as well. Mm -hmm. And it's just getting them to that point. Sometimes people have to feel bad enough that they want to get away from that feeling more than they want to avoid whatever frightens them about therapy. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you speak on um, other shows about uh, coming out, as you put it, uh, (laughs) relatively recently uh, in terms of sort of the more esoteric side of the practice and bringing that to the fore. I would, I would love to hear more about that. (laughs) So I think it's one of those things is as you get older, you know, you start to realize how much energy it takes to not um, share parts of yourself that feel fundamental with other people. And, you know, it's not like I'll go to a cocktail party and bring it up with everybody because not everybody, you know, wants to hear it. But um, I just feel like, you know, the people who feel comfortable working with me, knowing that this is um, part of my truth, Mm -hmm. will, will come and the people who are looking for something else will do well to find that. And, and that's all completely good. Yeah. Um, but you know how it is when you are not fully 
exploring and expressing who you are, it can just feel so stifling and so draining. Yeah. It was very liberating to just kind of be, and, and how great to see so many people who are also interested in this work that happen to also be, you know, have their feet on the ground, especially when they need to. Very much so. Yeah. And I think that is more and more becoming the norm. Mm. People that can straddle both worlds. Um, uh, and so, I mean, just in your own case, so, I mean, you're a PhD uh, from Columbia, you have a master's in public health from NYU, um, you know, a very serious minded person with a serious practice. Um, but it's important, I think, to bring the esoteric more into the fore um, to make it something that is normal um, and that is accessible and approachable and also useful. Um, you know, it's something that can improve the lives of ordinary people. Um, and transpersonal work, I think, is a you know once again a great way to do that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. So, I I wanted to talk a bit about diet because I know that's also an area of uh, emphasis for you, and also goes back to kind of taking care of the body, which is this great intuitive instrument that we have. Um, are there any kind of keystones that you um, rely on in advising people about what constitutes a healthy diet? Yeah. So of course it does vary person to person. There are a lot of diets that become trendy. Yes. What's nice about your body is it will tell you if something feels like it's working or not. Um, some people feel great on a higher fat diet and other people feel unwell. You should mm -hmm. pay attention to that. Um, I think generally foods that are less processed that help you to feel grounded enough because we have to live on planet earth. We have to do the mundane things too. And we should, we're yeah. in a body. We need to take good care of it. But um, also just being aware that we don't want to be, you know, if you're somebody who's eating a super meat heavy diet, you might feel too earthbound to be expansive. You know, your yeah, upper yeah. chakras are very expanded when you're tuning in. Um, so paying attention to that. Um, one of the things Lynn Buchanan talked about, and he said that they did research on this in the military, I don't believe they published this, was that people doing a lot of intuitive work use up a lot of B12. Mm. Now, B12, what's great about it is that you'll probably excrete what you don't need. I take more than the average person probably, and I find that I need it. I can tell when I'm starting to feel um, a little bit weak. Yeah. And, um, but other people might not find that that's necessary, but just paying attention to your body, expending energy, grounding yourself. I've seen people who stay too heady after they do intuitive work because yeah. they're not in their bodies enough. Mm -hmm. I think that's great advice. I mean, I know a, a lot of people that are really into keto for a while or paleo or whatever, and, you know, it, that might work for some people, but it might not be right for you. And so you should listen again to your own intuitive sense. Um, how about other supplements, like maybe glantamine or huprazine, which I've heard can um, help improve uh, dream recall or things of that nature. Do, do you have any uh, words of advice um, on those? You know, I am not familiar with them. Nope. And, and, and I, do know a lot about a lot of supplements, but I have not used those. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, I think the other practices that I'm familiar with, like keeping a dream journal can be helpful. I, yeah. I think the HemiSync technology is outstanding for meditation and for sleep. Mm -hmm. I've been interested in, in, you know, brainwave entrainment for a really long time that can help. Yeah. Um, but I would say paying attention to, again, how your body feels. If you're low on something, you know, it's mm -hmm. worth consulting with a professional and making sure that um, you get what you need. Yeah. Let's talk a, a, a bit about the dream journaling, because I know people have different approaches to that. Um, some folks get bogged down with trying to like write down every single detail of the dream. Um, and I, I'm just curious what your approach to it is. So I think that if you wake up in the middle of the night mm. and a dream feels very intense and it feels important, like there's something you want to make sure you remember. And, and I think most people, it's hard to describe, but most people know what I'm talking about. You've had that feeling like, I can't forget this. I need to remember this. I would write it down and I would write down 
whatever detail seems relevant and you might find yourself making notes at the end. As a psychologist, I would say sometimes the details that in the moment seem like, well, why is the fact that the feathers are white instead of gray important, but it might turn out that later on something in that symbolism is important, um, especially if it's a very prophetic dream. Mm -hmm. Um, but or also just maybe some in some symbolic way describing the people in the dream and if you notice how they felt yeah. writing that down you know if you're in a house which usually represents you mm -hmm. and your levels different levels of consciousness you know I would write down whatever detail even if it seems too um, you know minimal to really consider. Mm -hmm. But that said, I don't think people should worry about getting it wrong. The more you do it, the more you'll notice the types of things you want to make sure you note. Okay. Um, I'm very rarely somebody who's going to say there's one right way to do something. Uh -huh. Kind of just don't buy into that. Um, I feel like it can be stifling when we want to let people feel confident. Yeah. Very good. Um, so again, kind of trusting your intuition as to what <laughs> needs to be recorded. Um, cool. All right. Well, um, anything you want to say about this particular set of exercises that we've developed um, on the culti on the Cultivating Intuition album? So it's cultivating intuition and it's the foundation because the exercises are really meant to be foundational. Mm -hmm. they're, I think they're useful for people who've done some intuitive work or know they're intuitive and want to get back to it. But even for people who have never explored developing their intuition or aren't sure if they've had intuitive experiences yet, um, I think it, what it will do is prime people to expect success, be curious be more present in the now and um, learn how to tune their instrument. And what I think people will find is that even doing the chakra balancing exercise, it seems like, oh, it's really more hygiene. But I have to say, just doing the exercises, people may very well notice changes in their psychic perceptions just mm -hmm. from doing that, both mm -hmm. in the moment and generally. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Let's talk a bit about that. So what are some of the signs that things are shifting for you, that your perceptions are um, opening up, let's say? So a, again, the physical body feeling more in balance. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, so say your throat chakra tends to be a little tight and you have trouble expressing your will yeah. in, in the world um, or articulating things that are important to you, or you tend not to be a good listener. What you might find is as you balance that energy center, both the earthly functions tend to improve, but also that you pick up on more cl clear audience information. So again, hearing a song or hearing your own voice saying something or a phrase or hearing somebody knocking at the door five minutes before they actually do it, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a balanced root chakra is going to help you feel grounded in your body, but also more grounded after you do intuitive work. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. Well, you'll notice that you're not feeling as spacey after you do intuitive work. If your lower energy centers are balanced mm -hmm. and things like that, but again, more prophetic dreams, noticing more the um the very fleeting visual impressions you may get on the screen of your mind mm. um noticing that you're with somebody and you feel a, a pang in your solar plexus or that you feel all of a sudden very sad and being aware that it isn't your sadness that you're noticing uh -huh. so noticing that clairsentient and empathic psychically empathic information for what it is really good so this sounds like an exciting journey that uh, you'll be taking people on. Uh, can't wait to see it come out. And I hope that you'll <laughs> all check it out and enjoy it. Um, Tracy, do you want to tell people about uh, your social media handles or any upcoming events before we uh, say goodbye? Thank you. Well, um, most exciting event definitely is this album coming out. Really yep. excited and so grateful for this collaboration. Likewise. Again, big fan for a long time. And um on Instagram and Facebook. On Instagram, I'm at Dr. Tracy Stein. So just D R T R A C I S T E I N, um, Dr. T Stein on Facebook. And my website is uh, drtracystein.com. And so I'll always post updates there as well. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, Tracy. And uh, we'll see you all next time.